So yeah, so thank, thank, thanks for coming. Um, I've always uh, thought that you know, application security should be part of software development. And I tweeted the other day, like I think there was a hashtag like controversial things, and it was just application security as a concept goes away, it just becomes software development. As we've seen, you know, QA, when I started doing development way back uh, in 1987, so I'm showing my age here at Lotus Development just down the street here, um, we had a QA department. We had a head of QA and we had like 300 people and they all reported up and they did QA. And development wrote code and they handed it over to the QA team and you know, the old waterfall style of, of developing. And we all know that that's pretty inefficient and that's that handshake back and forth between different teams and different organizations is this useless bureaucracy, right? And so sort of agile came along and, and made QA and development all part of one, one team. It was just part of one process. So uh, we have sort of a similar problem with, uh, with, with security today where we have a security team that's charged with doing things that are like compliance and there's certain requirements that they need to do to meet their goals and then they have the development team on the other side and oftentimes we have this handing off back and forth very inefficient. So what I want to talk about today is now with DevOps and incorporating operations into the development team, there's the opportunity to incorporate security into that DevOps process so there's no separate security team, it just becomes part of developing software. Uh, but first I want to start off with some stats from the Veracode State of Software Security Report. We run as a SaaS company. Uh, we've scanned over three trillion lines of code over the last 10 years and um, over 200,000 applications. So every year we take the thousands of applications we've looked at and we mine, them for, mine it for data to hopefully shed some light um, on what's going on. And these are some of the stats from our late, latest state of software security report which came out a few months ago or about six months ago. And um, you know, for example, 35% of the applications we look at have some sort of hard-coded password, credentials, keys embedded um, in the application. And usually that's, that's not a good thing. So you know, a, a practice like that, really easy to detect. If you're not doing testing as part of your development cycle, you might be shipping code that has you know, hard-coded passwords um, embedded in it, and a lot of, a lot of people do. Um, another very common uh, weakness we see is uh, broken or risky crypto algorithms. So um, shockingly, we see this a lot in healthcare applications because HIPAA says you need to encrypt your code at rest and you need to encrypt it in, in transit. But, and they test for, you know, they do positive testing. Look, it connected and it looks like it's encrypting. But they don't actually, a lot of, a lot of organizations don't do the negative testing and say, well, could an attacker subvert the, subvert the crypto? And if that doesn't happen, it's likely that you're gonna ship code where the crypto is basically really not doing its job because an attacker you know, can get to it. And 39% of the time, we find that uh, it's easy to break, break the crypto. And this isn't like breaking you know, um, you know, uh, AES-128 or something like that, the actual algorithm. This is really the, the implementation is broken. They're using the system implementation, but they're not, they're not using the right parameters, they're using deprecated functions, they're not handling uh, error, uh, error cases correctly. There's a lot of things that can go wrong and we find that in 39% of the apps we look at are doing it wrong. Um, open redirect is another common problem we see in applications, 28% we see that. And then in 16% we see uh, applications mixing um, trusted and untrusted data in the same data structure so you can only imagine that that, that practice is, is going to lead to untrusted data getting in places where the attacker might be able to manipulate your, your application. So these are all some of the common things we see every single application um, we, we, we test. And if we look at the high level picture, we use something called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Projects, top 10 list of the most uh, critical and impactful vulnerabilities and we use that as a policy and we say, you know, if we held this application, we're testing up to that policy, would it pass? Would it have none of those top 10 vulnerabilities in it? And only 37% of the apps we look at pass. So if you're not doing adequate testing um, for your web applications at least, 
you are probably shipping an app that has one of these OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities in it in, into production. So hopefully I made the point that some sort of application testing um, is, is something you want to do as, as part of your development process. Um, well, what we're seeing now across all of our customers, we have enterprise customers, mid-sized customers, startups, um, software companies, and then you know, traditional um, enterprises like banking, healthcare, manufacturing. They all want to move to DevOps. They're all moving towards DevOps. We're seeing that everyone's aspiring to do that because of the speed and competitiveness it gives them. I was talking to a fertilizer company a couple weeks ago, and this fertilizer company um, is, is moving to DevOps, and they're moving to build mobile apps, web apps. They're actually doing IoT, so you can you know, put some device in your lawn, it talks to their cloud, and tells you you need to fertilize. Um, so it seems like every company, something even as prosaic as fertilizer, is, is latching on to technology to have a competitive advantage. And there's a good reason for this. A lot of traditional enterprises are scared because they see, um, they see their industry getting disrupted. They see a startup coming out of nowhere, using the cloud, building apps from scratch, leveraging mobile or IoT, and, and disrupting them. You know, Uber's probably the most famous one for, for the transportation industry, but there's lots of cases like this. We have old, old style banks, uh, banks that have been around for 100 years, who've always built software to manage all the data that they have to, are seeing themselves get disrupted by new banking startups, new, new fintech startups, things like Square and um, Stripe and these Venmo, right? They, the, the banks are saying, hey, I need to reinvent myself as, and build code like a startup. So you have these companies that are, have a lot of security requirements, like a bank, that uh, has compliance requirements. They have reg regulators at the global level, the national level, at the state level that they have to comply with, so they have to build in security. And now they're being asked by their CTOs um, and their businesses to build code in a DevOps style. So here we have something where you have strong security requirements, yet the business needs to go fast or the business is going to get disrupted. So we're starting to see this kind of clash between security um, and, and, and development. And so we, we saw this happen between development and operations over the last, the last 10 years where we're starting to see operations and development merge together, and that's what really DevOps is all about. But if you think about it, development and operations have goals that are, that are different, right? The, the development team wants to just build functionality as quickly as possible. Product management says build this feature, and their ideal would be like push it out that day that it was decided that we're going to build that feature. So they want to change rapidly and innovate rapidly. Um, and then on the other side, the operations team is gold with you know, keeping everything stable, right? They don't want to get up at 3 in the morning. They don't want to get the pager call. So they want, to, they, they want to make sure that they have the monitoring, the reliability. It's architected uh, to be reliable. Um, and DevOps is bringing those two things together. So the idea of you know, reliability and uptime is thought of as you're actually um, designing, architecting, and coding um, the software. And the things that operations people need to do, like bring up systems quickly, um, can use the techniques of, 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 of writing code, right, of development. So we've seen these two things merge together, and we're in the process of doing this at Veracode. Uh, we started off uh, 10 years ago sort of getting into Agile, and then about five years ago, I, I think we could say ourselves we were a fully Agile uh, development organization, and now we're slowly moving in, in, into DevOps. So we do have some teams that are doing DevOps. So we're seeing this transition happen at almost all of our customers. It's just happening at different rates uh, and, and, and paces. Uh, and it's much harder to do at a, at a very large uh, en enterprise that's been building code for 30 years the old way. So what I want to talk about today is how do we, how do we take the, uh, the process that happened between development and operations uh, to, build, to, to, to work as a singular, singular team and bring those concepts of, of security and stop having security be a separate team and bring it into the actual development process. Even though you might be using automation, you might be using tools um, in your development process, 
it doesn't necessarily mean you're working as a singular team. Uh, when we started doing this at Veracode, we, we, we had static analysis and uh, we built APIs and people could hook into their build system and they could, they could write the code and they could test the code, but then the results would go off to the security team and then the security team would kind of decide you know, what, what to fix and basically tell the development team what to do. And typically the development team fought this until the very last minute and then they said, okay, well, we only have a few days before we have to go into production, so give us the very few things that we can fix in a few days. And then they fought over those few things, and then you end up accepting risk or delaying the software, right? Not a very good dynamic between uh, a t two different teams that, that, that have different needs for the business, right? We need to protect the brand. Most businesses need to protect the brand. Um, if there's compliance requirements, they don't want to get fines. Um, and they don't, they, don't want, they don't want their customers to be disrupted and go somewhere else. That can happen from a security breach. So the security team has real goals that they need to meet, um, but they need to do it in a way that's not crushing the development team. And so when we're moving to this faster pace of DevOps, it's really coming to a head, and we really need to do things differently. You know, when I started doing security, it was like QA. The development team would build it and then throw it over the wall to another team, which then would do a manual pen test and try to find the vulnerabilities and then throw them back at the development team. So what I'm gonna talk about is how do we, how do we get rid of that, that mentality of really two separate teams and security can just be fully embedded and be part of that DevOps team. Some people call it DevSecOps or Secure DevOps. So you know the first thing is, and this is sort of the table stakes, you have to automate it in, right? If it's part of a dev DevOps process and it's not automated, it's not DevOps, right? You need something that will, you know, you write some code and then you put it into your pipeline and if all the tests pass, it ends up in production, right? That's, that's, you, that's the only way to go fast. That's the only way to have, uh, you know, a, re a release on a daily basis or even, even quicker releases. You can't have any manual steps. Right? The manual steps are the exception cases when something went wrong. Right? So the manu a manual step might be the performance test didn't pass. Someone put in code that made everything go slow, so that broke, broke the continuous deployment. We're not deploying that. It didn't pass the performance test. We're going to go and we're going we're to fix the problem. Right? So that's the exception case. So we need to think of security that way, as in we want the security test to all pass, and if they all pass, we go into production. If they don't, then you know, a ticket gets opened in the normal remediation process when tests don't pass. And security is just thought as another non-functional requirement that has to be met in order for something to go into production. So we want to get into that state. And that really means automating things like static analysis, which is you know, essentially uh, inspecting the code statically. Uh, software composition analysis, which is a way of looking at the libraries that are used to make sure there are no known vulnerabilities in any of the open source libraries being used. Um, the way software is being built these days, there's more code coming from those open source libraries typically than is being written um, by the development team. So you have a significant amount of risk that's in those libraries and any, any, day, any day that goes by, uh, a new vulnerability might be discovered in one of the libraries you're using and become publicly known. Well, you, you don't want to push another release out that, that, that has that known vulnerability in it because attackers know they, they, they can just go start scanning the internet for that, that known vulnerability. You've probably all heard of Heartbleed, which was the open SSL vulnerability from about three years ago. Um, but you know, there was one just recently in Struts 2, which was really bad. It was a command execution vulnerability. Um, we were even vulnerable to that at, at, at Veracode, um, but thankfully we, we, we had it fixed that day that the news came out. Um, so that's another thing that should be an automated process, software composition analysis. Dynamic analysis is akin to you know, doing that, that testing on a live running app with, with, with test data. Um, another, another technique for doing that, typically dynamic analysis takes longer because it's crawling the application. Um, and, uh, and, and it's permuting all the inputs into the application. So it can, it can typically take you know, many hours or even, even days with large applications. So a lot of times dynamic analysis will be out of band. You'll kick off the process um, to scan. You might go into production um, and then you might 
um, find, find a defect, and then you might you know, fix it rapidly and then push a new release out into production. So that, there's an important concept of um, not, putting every, not making everything a blocker. Things that, some things that take long periods of time, or unfortunately sometimes things will need human inspection to make decisions on. If that takes too long and your requirements are to, um, to, to stream things into production at a faster rate and you, you have some risk tolerance, you might think about um, the, the idea of putting vulnerable code into production and then rapidly remediating it um, in your next release. So um, you know, if you think about it from a risk-based scenario, um, you know, there's a window of vulnerability when you push that vulnerable code out into production uh, between when that's pushed out and when you fix it. If that's in the order of maybe a day, um, it's probably pretty unlikely that an attacker is going to find that vulnerability, figure out how to exploit it, and do that. So that's a risk management uh, decision um, you, 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 can, you can make. Because you're probably pushing out vulnerable code all the time anyway because you're doing inadequate testing. So just because you start doing better testing shouldn't mean that you start blocking your code from going into production. So it, it's really a, a risk management decision. I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about this. But um, you know, point, point three here, still do penetration testing, but don't gate your release on it. Penetration testing is almost always going to take longer. Um, than, than, than um, a DevOps release cycle. It's definitely going to take many, many days. Um, but what you can do is um, as you are um, doing your penetration testing, you stream those results back to the development team. So if it's a week-long process um, and you fix, find something on day one, development team can fix that one on day one. So it's a different way of thinking about manual penetration testing. The old way was you, you, you get your security experts to come in. They test for two weeks, they spend two weeks writing up the report, and then they have a readout call, and then you figure out what you want to fix. That old, old method is just too slow. That's sort of like a consultative um, method. So the new, the new way to do it is um, do it as during the development process, and even if you push into production, stream the results back so they can be fixed um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, the other, the other nice thing, uh, concept of DevOps is, you know, the earlier in the development cycle we can find the defect, um, the cheaper it is to remediate that defect. You know, it's an old, you know, IBM did a, did a study on, 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 on quality assurance a long time ago where, you know, finding something that was a design flaw in design is a 1x issue, 1x cost to fix, and if you found that in a production, it would be a 100x cost to fix because of the amount of code you'd have to do and the amount of production changes you'd have to do. Finding it during the test phase would be maybe a 30x because um, you're pretty far down in the process. Same goes, same goes for security. Um, finding things um, further down the process, it just is going to be more expensive to fix. So you want to try to automate your security testing as early in the process as, as possible. So you can think about it as sort of, you know, dynamic testing might be at the very end. You might do static analysis and software composition analysis you know, on the whole program you know, for every, every uh, build in your continuous integration. Um, you might have uh, developers, um, you know, when they might be doing their, their unit test, they might be just doing static analysis on their piece of code. It's further left, and the furthest left would be sort of in the IDE, catching issues as a developer is, is writing the code. Um, you know, completely pre-check-in. Pre and that's going to be the cheapest way to fix it because the developer just wrote the code that, you know, that hour. Um, and there's no other systems of record that have to manage the defect and people don't have to have processes to think about the defect. And, and it's, just, it's just fixed. It's like a syntax error. The developer just fixes it. So what we try to do is figure out what's the earliest place in the development lifecycle we can find a particular category of defect and, and, and try to fix it there. And even if you can't find them all in the IDE, if you can find 50% of the IDE, the ROI on having that as part of your process um, really makes it um, so that security isn't slowing down, slowing down the development process. You know, the best way to find an open, if there's a vulnerability in a piece of open source you're using, would be right when you're you know, pulling down that package and saying, hey, I'm going to use this package. Right at that time is probably when you should say, hey, is there any known vulnerabilities in this, this, this package I'm using. Um, 
as opposed to waiting to right before production to do that kind of that kind of test. Um, so just here's here's an example of some of the things you know I, I was I was talking about. You know you might want to do in the IDE. Uh, you could test the code uh, pre-check in. You can check it as part of and you can check it as part of your um, your your continuous uh, your continuous integration. The other thing that's important to realize is you know security testing is 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 imperfect. Um, and we, if you've ever dealt with security testing tools or even manual pen testers make mistakes, there's the notion of the false positive. There's the tool or the person says, I found this problem and you know, we need to stop the presses and we need to deal and fix with the problem. Well, if that's a false positive, that's very expensive, right? That's, that's your, you know, you're, you're, you're pulling the, the manufacturing line because you saw a defect and you're stopping the manufacturing line. Um, that's an expensive process. So because the tools are imperfect and because there are going to be false positives, there basically has to be a tuning to um, your tolerance for risk and your requirements for speed. And you might, have, um, you might have things that break the build, that stop, stop the build from going into production, be a different list of issues than all the security issues you might be looking for. So essentially, you, what you might say is the most, the most serious issues, I'll pick one, SQL injection is one thing that most of our customers do not want to ever go into production, um, even though that might have, say, a 10% false positive rate. Let's just throw a number out there. Um, that's something that my customers experience a lot for, for this type of issue. That means one out of 10 times, um, I'm going to you know, stop the build from going into production and I'm going to be frustrated. But if you're if you're if you're a um, if you say you're a bank and you know you're constantly under attack, you might make the decision to say, hey, you know, I know there's some false positives here, but this is such a serious issue. I'm constantly I, there's constantly people looking for SQL injection in my apps. I'm going to make the decision to, you know, break the break the build on that one. Um, and but say you're you know say you're a startup company, and no one knows who you are yet and you're just trying to show great functionality out there, uh, you, you might, and you're not regulated, you might make the decision, I'm not, I'm not gonna break the build on, on anything. I'm gonna let that SQL injection go into production and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna fix it um, out of band. So this is, this is where you have to use the tools, see what kind of results are coming out of your code, and, uh, and, and understand your risk, to your risk tolerance as, as a company. And it, it might change over time, right? It might change that you start off, when you start adding, incorporating application security into a development project, um, you might not be breaking the build on anything because there's just so much stuff being found. But then when you get to a steady state where really it's only small batches of new code that is the only place that there could be a vulnerability, it's not happening every day. Uh, maybe, maybe it's happening you know, every few weeks, a new vulnerability is showing up that you would want to break the build now you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna change your, your tolerance for the, for the false alarm. So it's kind of a learning experience, and, it, and from, my, from my experience, it, it's different for every project in, in, in every company um, based on their risk tolerance and, and, and basically you know, how, many, how, how, how much security debt they have in their code. Um, the other thing that is really important to, um, to getting security be part of, of development um, the development process is to actually have people who care about security, know something about application security, and they're actually developers. They're, they're part of the teams. That's the whole thing with DevOps. There's people there that understand reliability, site reliability, they understand operations, they understand the infrastructure environment, and they're part of the development team. That's what DevOps is, right? This is taking someone who is a developer and making them a security champion making them the security lead for that scrum team. And this is something that we do at Vericode and we've been working with our customers to do is identify one individual in every scrum team who's willing to raise their hand and say, you know, I'm kind of interested in, in, in application security. I'm willing to, to learn some new skills and I want to be the security champion for, for my scrum team. And so what we do is we, we do have a, a central security team that under, the, under, the, um, under our CISO and that team 
meets monthly with all the security champions. They get all together, they do additional training, they might look at a particular vulnerability and figure out how it might be exploited. They might do a capture the flag exercise or a tabletop exercise about, hey, we're getting these strange results coming out of the application. How do we diagnose this? And it builds up the skill level um, within every development team to create um, these, uh, these uh, security champions. And we keep track of sort of the maturity level of, each, of each, each product team. The other thing the security champion can do is they can recognize when the team needs some extra help, right? They might not be expert threat modelers or secure design reviewers, but they could recognize when there's been some new functionality, like we, they're cha you're, you're changing the way um, you know, account recovery happens or something like that. Um, and they can alert the security team and say, hey, wait a minute, this, this really needs to be manually tested. There needs to be a threat model done around the account recovery, how this is happening. Um, this looks like some security critical code. And the, and the, and the security champion can recognize that and, and ask the security team that, uh, to come in and, and do some additional review. So they can, they can sort of be the eyes and ears of the organization um, when it needs more help. Um, and then um, finally, you know, this is the ops in, 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 in uh, security, is m manage, monitor, monitor and manage the application at runtime, right? So one way of doing this is I talked about software composition analysis is monitor the national vulnerability database, places that have new known vulnerabilities or products that do this and understand what open source libraries you have running in production, and if new vulnerabilities come around, you have, this, you have this operational security concern of, hey, we need to quickly get that rebuilt with a new, less vulnerable um, package. Uh, that's an example of that. Um, other things are, are, are sending um, security events to, to your log monitoring. You know, this user has you know, had a lot of password failures. Um, or um, we're seeing strange things happen with the way people are connecting with uh, crypto and things like that. So the idea of you know, operational monitoring is one thing, but you can also take that aspect to security events and security functionality in the app and also mon monitor that. So just summarizing you know, where I talked about where security can be embedded in, you know, the old way of doing it was either you know, after the app has been in production, you're doing a pen test once a year, um, there's actually some compliance requirements like that. Um, when the code is changing on a daily or weekly basis, that's kind of silly, right? Um, and so a lot of organizations moved it to test, but as the development cycle gets uh, shorter and shorter iterations, you really need to move all the way left to develop and build. And, um, but, you know, not forget to do it, to do it here. Um, so a lot of times when I talk to security people about these concepts, they, um, they need to start a conversation with their, with their development team to kind of understand how the developers are, are building code and to talk with all the different development teams in their organization. So I came up with some, some questions um, that you know, so they should start and, and talk to maybe the architect of the application or the development manager. Um, or the team lead. Start with things like, you know, are you using a CI CD pipeline? Um, what, what kind of tolerance do you think you have for false alarms um, with the with this rate and pace of change of your application? Are you doing microservices? And the security team can start to get the lay of the application landscape and start to start the conversation um, because what we're going to do is we're going to try to take take what they're doing and move it into development and that that's that's a that's a, that's, a, that's a people management problem, right? It's a change management problem. All this technology can be used outside of the development cycle, maybe not the things plugged into the IDE, that's sort of uniquely a developer tool only, but a lot of these technologies are used outside and you need to start the conversation with the development team of how they, how they can see them being used um, um, inside. And again, on the, sort of on the operational side, you know, how, 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 what tools are out there to monitor um, for operational issues that we can embed uh, security, security into there. So um, 
one of the, one of the final things I wanted to mention was, um, you know, th this book here, uh, the DevOps Handbook. Um, if you're it, even if you're not moving to DevOps, even if you're an agile uh, organization, talks really about embedding um, se security into your, the development process in, a, in in the best way that I've seen it written. Um, I know the lead author, Gene Kim, and Gene Kim was the founder of a company called Tripwire. So if you've been around security since sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, Tripwire was sort of the premier host security tool. Um, it would scan your host configuration um, um, for you know, configuration vulnerabilities and you know, vulnerable packages and things like that. And um, so when Gene Kim sold, sold his company, he decided that his next career was going to be understanding how to build software better. So here we had a security guy trying to, who had a software company, but a security guy at heart, because um, you know, he founded a security software company, um, go out. And, and so he teamed up with these guys, Jez Humble, Patrick Dubois, and, and, and John Willis, who are really more on the software engineering side. And the combination, um, and there's several chapters in here about um, how to, how, to, how to build a high reliability and high security um, application using, using DevOps. And uh, he doesn't call it DevSecOps or Secure DevOps, but in the subtitle, it's how to create world-class agility, reliability, and security in technology organizations. So we've, we've all read this at Vericode, and uh, if you're interested in DevOps and, and securing DevOps, I highly recommend it. I don't get paid for this. I'm, I don't have any stake in the book, so it's not a shill. So, um, with that, I think we have about five minutes left. Um, if anyone has any, any questions, I guess there's some microphones back there. In terms of like the static analysis um, and infrastructure as a service, um, what tools are out there to do static analysis and you know, analysis of infrastructure code before it becomes the infrastructure you can scan it with traditional tools? So um, you can definitely do that. I mean, especially if it's open source. You can say use the same tools that you might be using on your code on, on the infrastructure components um, you're using, you know, as long as you have access to those. Like, you know, if you're using a cloud provider, you don't necessarily have access to their implementation of it, you know, even if they're basing it on open source. But if you have open source infrastructure components, you can definitely um, do static analysis on there. And a lot of times people do that and find you know, there's known vulnerabilities in the libraries um, that are used in, in, in that code. So you can do the same thing pushing it, you know, pushing it down um, one level. You know, one of the challenges that we find though, um, sort of a caveat here, is um, don't be surprised if on a lot of projects, if you find a vulnerability, you're on the hook to fix it. Um, you know, we all hear about the, the most popular projects out there you know, Tomcat and, and things like that, or Spring Library, those are very, those have, they, those have teams that are very responsive to security issues, and, they'll, and they, they will take it seriously and fix it. But I would say, you know, at least 50% of the time, we find issues in some infrastructure component, and the development team goes, hey, it's open source, you fix it. Right, so I, you might be on so, the hook that. Yeah, so, so you're saying scan, like, the open stack, as yep. opposed to the heat template. Like, is there, is there anything that would um, look at the heat templates you're going to generate and say, you know, this network is, you're leaving this network to, you know, so you So that's more on the network configuration, uh, you know, the configuration side. Um, I think what you'd want to do there is you'd want to, you know, you'd want to scan a running instance of that. That's probably better to, to scan once it's, built and executing some issues like that. Just the terminology clarification, yep. is there any difference between what you call dynamic analysis on that slide and what people used to think of as just automated pen tests, like a HP Web Inspect or something? Yeah, so that's what I mean by dynamic analysis. Um, a, a, a tool like Web Inspect that crawls the application, finds the inputs, and then and then um, you know, attacks those inputs with you know, SQL injection attack strings, cross-site scripting attack strings. There's also the idea of fuzzing applications. So you know, an API um, that you know, takes, takes certain, certain class of input, you're not crawling it, but you, you might be sending you know, random data into hopefully somewhat structured 
um, in, 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 in fuzzing APIs and things like that. That's another class of dynamic. I think there was a question over here. So, so you talked a lot during, we talked about sort of the, the dev stream and how when you took it built, uh, getting automated tests to do it. Uh, what about when new attack vectors they discover? Uh, is there, uh, do, are you working on some kind of a DevOps system for, you know, hey, this new attack vector got discovered, how do we, to your point, spider the system to, to figure out where it might get better? Right, so, so, so part of that's going to be taken care of by your, you know, your tool provider that should have a security research team that's looking at, you know, these new new attack vectors and is incorporating into the their scanning um, technology. Um, you know that that might be slow in certain cases, so you might want to actually do some manual tests for that particular thing if it's until your until your you know, your security technology provider can can build those scans in. Another question? Chris, what's your take for uh, what state of the art is sort of all the way over to the left, sort of integrated into the IDE, providing development feedback? What's, what are some of the best techniques? What things do you think are coming down? So there's, there, there seems to be two classes of tool. One is more of um, what I'll, I'll call a, um, a spell checker. Right, it's really doing lexical analysis. It's really just looking at and it's saying, "Hey, this, this, um, you know, this this function call is is not allowed by a secure coding standard, so you, you can't you can't use that." It's sort of like the you know doing a misspelling. It's very the context is very 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 small, uh, and there's a there's a class of products out there that 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 do that. Um, you know, I, I look at that and I say, remember the old days where you used to write your whole document and then you, you, then you went to the menu and said, now do the spell checking and you went through the spell checking all at once and then the spell checking just became something that happened in the background all the time. So, I, you know, that's another sort of analog of how this is moving to just be continuous in the, in the ID. The other one, and this is what we do at Vericode, is actually we do full static analysis. So, um, you know, you're in something like Eclipse, and you know, every time you save the file, uh, or the, if you have background autosave on, Eclipse actually saves it and then compiles that, say, uh, you know, Java, Java file, class file. Um, what we do is then we do a static analysis on that entire class file, which hopefully gives more context than just a, um, you know, more of a lexical analysis, more of a, not, not as much a secure coding standard, but is actually saying it looks like you actually Following the data flow here, it looks like you actually have a vulnerability. So those are two things that people are doing in IDEs, and you could actually do both if you, if you wanted to. Okay, I think we're just about out of time, so thanks, thanks for coming and hearing me out.